Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first recorded lecture of Real Analysis 2. That we're going to start off with the statement of this theorem. Every convergent uh, sequence is bounded. Now, in order to make this a little bit easier to prove, we'll put this in the form of, uh, we'll put the statement of this theorem in the form of a conditional statement. If the sequence A sub n converges, then the sequence A sub n is bounded. So we can clearly identify our hypothesis and conclusion. So let's start the proof off easy, do it the easy way, and say let the hypothesis be given. So there's our hypothesis. The sequence A sub n converges. But let's be a little bit more specific. If the sequence converges, it has to converge to a limit, right? So let's mention specifically what the limit is. This sequence converges to some limit L. Now, what do we know about a convergence sequence, a sequence that converges to a limit L? Isn't it true that a sequence converges to a limit L if and only if, for every epsilon greater than zero, the interval L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon, contains all but finitely many terms of the sequence. So let's mention that because I think it's going to be very helpful. Okay, I think this will take us a long way. The interval L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon, contains all the finitely many terms of the sequence A sub n. And it's going to turn out that we're going to have to consider two separate cases.
you see, if this interval contains all but finitely many terms of the sequence, then it may be possible that this term actually contains every term of the sequence. Hmm. So that means that every term of the sequence is greater than L minus epsilon and less than L plus epsilon. So if this interval actually contains every term of the sequence, then every term of the sequence is bounded below by L minus epsilon and bounded above by L plus epsilon. In other words, the sequence is bounded. Now we can look at the other case where this interval does not contain every term of the sequence. Okay, I'm back. We took care of the first case, uh, namely the case where the entire sequence, every term of the sequence, is contained in the interval L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon. That we took care of that case. Now we're going to consider the other possibility, that there are some terms, finitely many, that are not contained in this interval. And so n sub k is the largest subscript of terms that are not contained in this interval. And here's a very obvious fact, but a fact that we probably don't think about uh, often enough. There are probably times in analysis and in other areas uh, where we need to make use of what I'm about to say, and yet it may not dawn on us. So even though this is a very obvious fact, I'm going to beat it to death. Uh, I'm, I'm going to emphasize it a lot more than I should, but I'm doing that because we might have the tendency uh, to overlook this fact when it may be of great use to us. So maybe if I beat this fact to death a few times, uh, it will be less likely to escape our notice when we need to use it. And here's what I'm about to say. This collection of terms is a non-empty set of finitely many real numbers. It's a non-empty set, so there's at least one element in here. But there are only finitely many real numbers in here. And because of that, there has to be a largest element, and there has to be a smallest or least element. This is the fact. Every non-empty set of finitely many real numbers has to have a largest and a smallest element. And you're hearing me say this, and you're saying to yourselves, duh. And it is an obvious fact. But forgive me, but I'm going to beat this to death because sometimes when we really need to use this 
obvious fact the most, it just doesn't occur to us to use it. So I'm going to beat it to death, and hopefully when we really need to use this fact, it'll come to us. So we'll call the largest value of this collection capital M, and we'll call the least or smallest value little m. Now, it could be the case, since all of these terms are outside of the interval L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon, it could be the case that all of these terms are outside of this interval because they're all greater than L plus epsilon, in which case this set of elements, as well as all of the rest of the elements in the sequence, are bounded below by L minus epsilon. So we'll account for the possibility that maybe the least element in this set could be the smallest element of the whole sequence, or maybe all of these elements are greater than the largest bound, and hence L minus epsilon is the least upper bound. No, I gave the smallest element in this set a name so that I wouldn't have to list all of these out. So, let's see. M. The smaller of these two values, M and L minus epsilon, is a lower bound for the sequence. Now, it could be the case that all of these terms are outside this interval because they're all less than L minus epsilon, in which case L plus epsilon is an upper bound for all of these terms, and it's also an upper bound for the rest of the terms of the sequence. So we have to allow for that possibility.
L plus epsilon could be the upper bound of all of these terms and the rest of the terms of the sequence. If it isn't, it's because the largest of these terms is larger than L plus epsilon. So we'll say the maximum of capital M and L plus epsilon is an upper bound. So, we've established that our sequence has an upper bound, the lesser of little m and l minus epsilon, and our sequence has an upper bound, the greater of capital M and l plus epsilon. So, our sequence is bound. Before we can do our next theorem, we need to look at some definitions and also some examples. So here we go. The sequence A sub n is monotone increasing exactly when A sub 1 is less than or equal to A sub 2, which is less than or equal to A sub 3, which is less than or equal to dot, dot, dot less than or equal to a sub n, and so forth. In other words, when every term is less than or equal to its successor, every term is less than or equal to the term that comes after it. Now, having defined monotone increasing, uh, we'll add a new definition. The sequence a sub n is strictly monotone increasing exactly when a1 is less than a2 a2 is less than a3 a3 is less than dot 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 which is less than a sub n and so forth uh, in other words the the sequence is strictly monotone increasing when every term is less than the term that comes after it each term is less than its successor. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, and I think I'm going to pause for a second so I can think of some examples. Okay, let's look at this one. The sequence is 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5. And how do we get these values? We use what's known as the least integer function. That's what these two braces represent. And we interpret this as the least or smallest integer that is either greater than n plus 1 or equal, I'm sorry, greater than n plus 1 over 2 or equal to n plus 1 over 2. Let's just try the first few values and see how it works. Let's let n equal 1. That will give us 2 over 2, which is 1. The smallest integer that is greater than 1 or equal to 1 is 1. Now let's let n equal 2. That gives us 3 halves, which is 1.5. The smallest integer that is greater than 1.5 or equal to 1.5 is 2, right? Well, here it is. Now let's let n equal 3. That gives us 4 over 2, which is 2. 
the smallest integer that is greater than 2 or equal to 2 is 2, right? And here it is. We'll do one more. Let's let n equal 4. So we have 5 over 2, which is 2.5. The smallest integer that is greater than 2.5 or equal to 2.5 is 2.5, right? No. The smallest integer that is greater than 2.5 or equal to 2.5 is 3, right? Well, here it is. This is the fourth term. This is what we get for n equal 4, and so on. Now, is this term monotone increasing? Let's see. We have 1 less than or equal to 2, less than or equal to 2, less than or equal to 3, less than or equal to 3, less than or equal to 4, less than or equal to 4, dot, dot, dot. Uh, this is monotone increasing. Let's see, increasing, I think there's an R in there somewhere. And maybe I'm wrong. Now, is it strictly monotone increasing? If it's strictly monotone increasing, then every term is greater than the term that precedes it, or every term is less than the term that succeeds it. Does that happen here? Well, no, it doesn't. These two terms are the same. But we can't say that 2 is less than 2. So this term is not strictly less than the term that succeeds it. And these two terms, 3 is not strictly less than 3. 3 is not less than the term that succeeds it. And so on and so forth. So I guess the most precise way to classify this sequence is to say it's monotone increasing. but not strictly monotone increase. Now let's look at if, uh, yeah, we'll look at another example. Okay, what about this one? This is pretty easy, isn't it? It's just the natural numbers, and they increase in size from one term to the next. So 1 is less than 2, which is less than 3, which is less than 4, which is less than so forth and so on. And in turn, the nth term is less than, strictly less than, the n plus first term. This, this sequence actually satisfies both definitions. And as we can see, if it, uh, every term of the sequence is strictly less than the term that comes before. One is strictly less than two, two is strictly less than three, and in general, n is strictly less than n plus one. 
So this sequence is strictly monotone increasing. Uh, but oddly enough, we find out in this example that in general, any sequence that is strictly monotone increasing is also monotone increasing. So any sequence that satisfies the definition of strictly monotone increasing, well, that sequence is also plain old monotone increasing as well. Okay. Now you had to know that this was coming. Uh, we defined monotone increasing and strictly monotone increasing. So now we have to define monotone decreasing and strictly monotone decreasing. And the definitions are analogous. A sequence is monotone decreasing exactly when a sub 1 is greater than or equal to a sub 2, which is greater than or equal to a sub 3, and so on. Exactly when each term is greater than its successor. Each, uh, nope. Exactly when each term is greater than or equal to its successor. So every term is greater than or equal to the term that comes after. And if there's such a thing as monotone decreasing, there has to be something called strictly monotone decreasing. And a sequence is strictly monotone increasing when A1 is greater than A2, which is greater than A3, and so on. In other words, when each term is greater than the term that comes after it, every term is greater than its successor. And are we going to look at some success, uh, some examples? Uh, yeah, we'll look at one or two. Uh, here's a term that's, well, let's see, what is it? When n is 1, we have 2 over 1, which is 2. When n is 2, we have 3 over 2, which is 3 halves, 4 thirds, 5 fourths. Uh, in each case, the, the denominator is n, and the numerator is one larger. And it is the case that each term is strictly larger than the one that follows. So this sequence is strictly monotone decreasing. But I guess that also means it's monotone decreasing, right? It's both strictly monotone decreasing. and monotone uh, decreasing. And obviously, if a sequence is strictly monotone decreasing, then it's also monotone decreasing. Now let's see. I, I guess this is obvious that it's decreasing, right? Uh, to show that, we just have to show that each term is larger than its predecessor. It's obvious. I, I don't think I should have to show it, but if I did, I guess my logic would be this.
If the first term is larger than the second, then their difference will be positive, okay? So, let's see, I gotta get a common denominator. And what do I get? n squared plus 2n plus 1 over n times n plus 1 minus n squared plus 2n and that's greater than 0. So the difference of two successive terms is positive that that means that each term is greater than the one that comes after it. So yes, this is strictly monotone decreasing. Monotone decreasing. Every term is greater than the one that comes after it. Now maybe I should do one more example. Well, what about this thing? Every term is equal to 1. The sequence goes 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So is this monotone decreasing? Yeah, I guess so. 1 is greater than or equal to 1, which is greater than or equal to 1, and so on. But you know what? If we look at it in that light, we're also going to have to say that this is monotone increasing. So here it's monotone decreasing. And here we show it's monotone increasing. So a constant sequence is going to be monotone something, monotone increasing, monotone decreasing, whatever we want to make it. Now, there's a reason why I wanted to define increasing, decreasing, strictly monotone increasing, strictly monotone decreasing, and so forth. Uh, we need that definition for our next theorem. Here's our theorem. It's called the monotone convergence theorem. It's also called the bounded convergence theorem. In order to uh, avoid any ambiguity with a, a, a theorem by the same name and measure theory, so it's called the bounded convergence theorem or the monotone convergence theorem. And the statement of the theorem is this. Every monotone increasing sequence that is bounded above converges. That's the statement of the theorem. Now, it's also true that every monotone decreasing sequence that is bounded below converges. It's not part of the statement of the monotone convergence theorem or the bounded convergence theorem, but Essentially, we establish this fact the way we establish this fact. And in order to help us prove the theorem a little bit more easily, I'm going to restate it as a conditional statement. Here's a restatement of the theorem as a conditional statement. If A sub n is a monotone, I'm sorry, if a sub n is monotone increasing, 
and bounded above, then a sub n converges. So let's do our proof. And to start off, I hit the chicken switch. Here's what I do. I'll just restate the hypotheses. So we have our hypotheses. This sequence is bounded above. So what do we know about every sequence that's bounded above? If a sequence is bounded above, uh, the least upper bound axiom for sequences tells us that it has a least upper bound, right? And we'll call it we'll call it U. So this sequence has a least upper bound. And we know that by the least upper bound axiom. for real valued sequences. Since our sequence has a least upper bound u, I might as well let the cat out of the bag right now and say that it's our intention to show that this sequence converges to the least upper bound u. That's our intention. Now, I claim that given any epsilon greater than zero, given any epsilon greater than zero, there's a natural number n 
such that a sub n is greater than u minus epsilon. Now, what on earth would cause me to think something like that? I'll tell you why. If no such n exists, that means that a sub n is less than or equal to u minus epsilon for all natural numbers n. If this isn't true, if there isn't some natural number n such that a sub n, excuse me for a minute, I beg your pardon, somebody standing out in the hallway obviously has a very important conversation that they need to uh, have on their cell phone. Okay, where were we? If it's not true that for some natural number n, a sub n is greater than u minus epsilon, then for all natural numbers n, a sub n is less than u minus epsilon. So in other words, every term of the sequence is less than u minus epsilon. Well, is there a problem with that? There sure is. First of all, it means that u minus epsilon is an upper bound of our sequence. But you know, it means something more than that. Because this number, u minus epsilon, is less than u, and u is supposed to be our least upper bound. Ooh. Okay, so now we got it spelled out. There exists an n such that for some term in the sequence, a sub n is greater than u minus epsilon. Uh, otherwise, if this isn't the case, then for Every term of the sequence for every natural number n, a sub n is less than or equal to u minus epsilon. In other words, every term of the sequence, a sub n is less than or equal to u minus epsilon. But if that's true, that means that u minus epsilon is an upper bound of this sequence. Okay. But wait a minute u minus epsilon is less than u, and u is supposed to be the least upper bound of this sequence. It gives us a contradiction. If this isn't true, then that contradicts the fact that u is the least upper bound of the sequence. So this thing has to happen.
So we've used part of our hypothesis. We've used the part uh, that says that our sequence is bounded above. Have we used the part that says the sequence is monotone increasing? I don't think so. So let's use it now. A sub n greater than u minus epsilon or u minus epsilon less than a sub n. We have that. So we haven't used this part of the hypothesis yet. Uh, this is just a repetition of this fact. But since the term is monotone increasing, look what happens. Since the term, uh, since the sequence is monotone increasing, every term that succeeds a sub n has to be greater than or equal to a sub n. And since u is the least upper bound of this sequence, it also means that these things have to be less than or equal to u. Now, let me restate that in a slightly different form. A sub n is a member of the interval u minus epsilon u. For all n greater than or equal to capital N. That's what this means. And I could take the ball right now and push it over the goal line and score my touchdown right now. Uh, but I'm going to have one more remark that sets up the final result. And before I draw attention to the statement that I want to make, I want to correct a slight inaccuracy with the last statement I made before I erased the board, uh, I had a sub capital N is an element of this interval for all little n greater than n. Uh, what it should say is a sub little n is in this interval for all little n greater than or equal to capital N. So make this change in your notes right here this subscript had been capital N, it should be little n. And now I can take this statement and get what I really want. If A is in this interval from U minus epsilon to U, it's definitely got to be in this interval. U minus epsilon, U plus epsilon for all little n greater than n. And uh, you know what? So u is the least upper bound. Technically, I guess these terms could be equal to u. So hmm, this would be even more correct. a sub n is in this interval. But if that's true, then a sub n is also in this interval u minus epsilon, u plus epsilon, for all natural numbers n greater than n. So which terms of the sequence may not be in this interval? 
The only terms of the sequence that might not be in this interval are those terms that have a subscript less than capital N. In other words, the first capital N minus one terms of the sequence might not be in this interval. But the first capital N minus one terms, in other words, now ah, let me write it out. If a sub n is in this interval for all little n greater than or equal to capital N, then the only terms that might not be in this interval are all of those terms that precede a sub capital N. Consequently, Uh, the interval u minus epsilon, u plus epsilon, contains all but finitely many terms of our sequence. And this implies that a sub n this sequence a sub n converges to our least upper bound. So I've proved the monotone convergence theorem or the bounded convergence theorem uh, but I'm going to restate it because we actually proved a little bit more than what the theorem stated. So let me restate this. Okay. This is what we actually proved. Every monotone increasing sequence that is bounded above converges to its least upper bound, u. So not only did we prove that every monotone increasing sequence that is bounded above converges, uh, we proved that it converges to its least upper bound, u. And we'll make use of that additional fact on occasion. Now, the other part of this theorem, every monotone decreasing sequence that is bounded below converges to its greatest lower bound. That's also true. 